In this video we are going to parallelize a sorting algorithm. Sequentially a very popular sorting algorithm is quicksort where we split the, an array into two parts. We first move the lower, the, the lower values to the left, the higher values to the right and uh, we split them hopefully in the middle but actually we take a random sample from the array and everything lower than that we move to the left and everything right, higher to the right. And then you see that uh, quicksort calls itself because after we have moved a part to the left then everything be between the lower bound and uh, the splitter we, uh, we uh, quicksort again and we do also the same for everything up to the higher part. A splitter then is just a va an index uh, with a value such that all values uh, to the left, so with indices lower than the splitter R, are uh, lower in value than uh, the, the value of the splitter. In this case the splitter value is 8. Everything below 8 you can see to the left, 3, 6, 2, 7, etc. And everything higher is to the right, but within those sub-intervals they need not be ordered because that's what the next call, a recursive call will do. So here we see how the splitting is being done. Uh, first of all you take if we split an interval between low and high inclusive the boundaries then we take an index which we call the, piv the pivot uh, which is the index of the sample that we take. Val is the value and then we run through the, through the array uh, with an index j. We start at low and we end at uh, high minus 1 because the value that we've chosen we j first put at the, uh, at the end of the uh, array. We park it and uh, we only consider then everything up to and including high minus 1. And then what we do is if we have a value xj we compare it to val and if it is lower than the value it has to move to the left so we sw swap it with xi and uh, everything up to i has values lower but it's exclusive the i uh, so we're going to put it there the, the xj value and then we increment i because we have one more value which is below the pivot value and at the end when this is done we swap uh, the, the highest value back into its position i and that way we have uh, split, it, uh, split the array, the interval between low and high. Now I have a question to you. A loop invariant is just a statement of what is true at a certain point in the algorithm. Here you can see a loop invariant in red but I didn't formulate it yet. So can you formulate a loop invariant Meaning, can you state what have we done at the point where the loop variant is inserted? Okay, the answer to the question is we have this interval between low and high. We have an i, a j and uh, i is less than or equal to j and with these numbers the interval we basically split into three parts. Everything between low and i, excluding i, has values below val. Everything between i and j, excluding j, has values higher than or equal to val. And everything between j and i, we didn't process yet. So at the end of the algorithm, when j equals high minus 1, then uh, we just have either the first or the second statement uh, being true and so we have split the whole array. So here is the basic idea of the general regular sample sort. Uh, what we have here is a parallel sorting what, what do we want? We have a bunch of numbers, 27 numbers in this case, and they are just in some random order 
on three different processors. We have three processors, white, yellow, and red. And now, to what we want is that they are in perfect order, like you see at the bottom, at the end of the algorithm, and that all the elements of the first processor, processor zero, the white processor, that they are lower than the elements in the yellow processor. And those are again, in turn, lower than those of the red processor. That's what we want to achieve. So the question is, how do we do that? The basic idea then is, first, you uh, sort the local values. And uh, when we go from the top to the middle, you see that uh, locally we have sorted the array. We can use any of the uh, known sorting algorithms, sequential algorithms, like quicksort we could do. But then, what, how do we continue? We take samples. And uh, a sample uh, is just one of the elements, and since we already sorted them, we can do this at regular intervals. In this case, at, an in, at a step size of three. So we take uh, the element two, element seven, uh, and so on, on the first processor. And we do that in every processor. In this case, every processor has three samples. So altogether, we have nine samples. And then the idea is that we sort those samples and we pick only three of them, like 0, 7, and 17 are the samples that we pick. And those become the global samples. And then everybody can compare its locals, local values to those samples and knows exactly whether you have to send a value to the white processor, to the yellow processor, or to the red processor. So then those values are being sent. And then, uh, finally, all the values that have been sent, we merge them uh, through a merge sort uh, to uh, sort them locally. And the magic of ho this whole algorithm is that we can prove that the block size of the outcome is never more than twice the block size of the input. And that means that there is some variability in the block sizes of the, of the uh, output, but not too much. OK, so now I will give a sketch of the sample sort algorithm. And I will not uh, give all the details, but this is, this is what would be the first phase of designing the algorithm. That's the, to have the general idea and to design the super steps. So in super step zero, I do a local sort. And this could be a sort of the vector x of all the data where you use the block distribution. And you start at s times the block size. You finish at s plus 1 times the block size minus 1. And uh, this is, uh, well, this is the. Uh, the sort that we do. And uh, that's a good start of, uh, of the algorithm, sorting lo locally. And then we take samples, p samples, at regular intervals. And this p samples is p samples per processor. Now, the cost of this is a quick sort, a sort of length n would cost n log n. Uh, but here we have n over p. We have a block uh, b equals n over p, n data, p processors, b is the block size. And then the cost would be n over p log n over p. And taking these samples at regular intervals, that's negligible. It's uh, order n over p. That's less than what, what we have here. Now, in super step one, we are going to, to send the sam local samples to all processors, to p star. And the cost of this is then p times p 
minus 1. We are sending P samples to P minus 1 processors and uh, we multiply by G, which is the cost of uh, communication. Uh, you see all processors send and receive the same number. And then once we have that, every processor can, in super step 2, can sort the local samples. And you take then P global samples at regular intervals. So we have all those local samples collect collected into P squared samples and everybody has them. So everybody can do the same and we sort those samples and the best way to do that is to have a merge sort because we can send the local samples already in order and that makes it easier and then we have p squared data and the cost would be, be p squared log p because in a merge sort we, eat, we merge pa pairwise and each time we have to go through all the data and if you look at it, altogether it you need the log p passes through the data. So this is the cost. And as a result, we have the glo p global samples. And now everybody knows these, and we are going to use them to split all the data that we have into p parts. So every processor has p parts, and that, uh, that helps in sending the data to the processors. So super step three is uh, splitting the local data using the s global samples and then we have XST is the contribution of processor PS to processor PT. And then we send XST to PT. So based on those global samples, everybody can split its local uh, array into P parts and sends its contribution XST to PT. OK, to this find the cost of this, we, we say that BS is the number of data received by processor S. So the cost of this, if we look at the cost of sending, then you send out your whole local block. Uh, in the worst case. So we, we have uh, the sending uh, has an upper bound of B and the receiving, if all processors receive uh, at most BS and we don't know what BS uh, is, then we say the maximum of B and BS and then we take the maximum over all processors. So later we'll say something about what is BS? For the time being, we don't know, we just give it a name. And then, in super step 4, we can concatenate and we get XS is the sum of all the contributions from T to S. So we take all the processors, all the target processors, and note that I've written here T and S in a different order. It is because here I was the sender, so as S I send, but here I'm the receiver. So I received from T, I received, I received this, and all of them together uh, are what is meant for me. And then I can do a merge sort,
because all the parts that I received are already ordered and then I get what I want altogether. Okay, and the cost of this merge sort is uh, we have to go again th log p times through the data and how many data do we, do we have locally b s. So the cost is max s uh, b s log p. So this, these are the costs of the, of the algorithm and you can add them up. Uh, I won't do that uh, here on the, on the board. Okay, so we have developed the algorithm, uh, also made a cost analysis, and uh, if we add up all the numbers, then you get, uh, get uh, quite an, uh, a formula with at the beginning we see the computation time, then the communication time, everything uh, in front of the G, and we have five super steps, so we have five L synchronization time. And we, uh, we want to have insight, like Richard Hemming said already in 1962, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers, or not formulas, I would say in this case. So we simplify, and uh, one way of doing that is just dropping lower order terms, and then we, uh, we just keep two terms for the computation, two terms for the communication, and we don't need to uh, simplify the synchronization. Okay, when we look at the first two terms, these are computation terms, you see that it is interesting to compare n over p with p squared. Uh, this may influence whether the first or the second term of the computation is dominant. Now, if p squared is less than n over p, meaning that p is less than the cube root of n, then the second term is certainly less than or equal to the first term and we only have to look at the first term really in approximation. And in that case, we also see that the, in the communication term, p squared is also less than 2n over p, so it's the second term, 2n over p, that dominates. And that way we get a very simple formula which gives insight. And you see that in this uh, formula, the computation has been perfectly parallelized, uh, n log n divided by p. The communication is just 2n over p times g, meaning that at most we communicate two times the local data and much less you cannot expect, so that's good. And 5L synchronization time. To summarize everything, we have seen that we can uh, sort by a parallel sample sort at uh, regular intervals we take samples and use these to split the local data into p subblocks and then these subblocks are being sent or we use them to send data to their destination uh, processor and then we get output block sizes that are imbalanced the block sizes are not exactly the same but they are within a factor of two of, uh, of a perfect balance so that's not too bad so a final question to you is, can we reduce this imbalance factor, which is at most two, but can we reduce it by adjusting the algorithm?